let's let's go right into this uh, retaliatory strike that uh, Israel conducted. And there had been a lot of speculation leading up to this because there was a great deal of time between the, the October 1 uh, barrage of, of ballistic missiles by Iran into Israel and the time when they finally decided to, to do their strike. And there was a lot of speculation about what was their target package going to be. Would it be nuke facilities, which would sort of be top end? Would it be uh, energy infrastructure? Would it just be military sites? Were you surprised at the end of the day when they finally conducted the strikes uh, at their target package? I, I actually was. And uh, what's fascinating is that what Israel did really set them up for future success. They mainly attacked Iranian surface air missile sites and uh, Iranian manufacturing sites that manufactured fuel and components for their weapon systems. And the brilliant thing about that is a lot of these sites are out in the middle of the desert, right? They're nowhere, especially a surface air missile site. So Israel can strike those targets. They can attrit Iran's surface air missile capability while simultaneously not really having any footage to show online. If there's no footage to show online, Iran gets to save face and they don't they might not necessarily feel the need to counterattack Israel. So in a lot of ways, everybody wins, of course, except the, the four Iranian members of, uh, of Artesh, their army that uh, that died in that attack. Yeah, this is this is sort of a, a, a sidebar question, I suppose. It's not really directly uh, with what we're, we're, we're going to be talking about. But do you think that that final selection of sites uh, was influenced to any degree by pressure from the White House? I don't. I think it was influenced by the capability of their weapon systems. Uh, one of the things you saw a lot was Israel's use of uh, ballistic missiles, air to, air launched ballistic missiles like the Rocks, uh, maybe the Air Laura, uh, maybe the Golden Horizon. Although that 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 came out of that leaked document thing, which I'm not allowed to read. I promised my security manager I did not read that document, <laughs> but uh, the. Um, the most of the attacks came from these air launched ballistic missiles which have a limited uh, sized warhead so you're not moving a lot of mud with these air launched ballistic missiles and because that you can't really go after those nuclear sites that require uh, heavy bombs like multiple 2000 pounders to penetrate all that earth and concrete so this actually made a lot of sense from a tactical standpoint because it allowed israel to fire at iran from a standoff range or perhaps use some f-35s uh, at least for battlefield coordination or very uh, precise targeting of some of these sites. Uh, okay, the as far as the air defenses go, um, yeah. reporting had it that the Iranian military had a total of, I believe, four um, S-300 uh, Russian yeah. air defense systems. And one had been taken out in April uh, during the course of an uh, Israeli strike. And then reportedly they took out the other three during this latest strike. If you were the supreme leader of Iran, would you ask for your money back from Putin? <laughs> so not necessarily. So uh, the, I think they spent about $800 billion on that particular system. Uh, but one of the things I like to, to compare it to is uh, something like uh, Spearman, right? If you were in a, in a phalanx of Spearman during the, the Greek era, right? The, the range of your spear is about 15 meters. But if somebody has an arrow, well, that, that's a range of, uh, not 15 meters, 15 feet. If someone has an arrow, that's a range of about uh, 200 yards or so, right? So if these systems were not designed to intercept theater ballistic missiles, it's not really the fault of the person on the receiving end. And the S-300 can intercept these theater ballistic missiles However, if Russia didn't sell them the software upgrades, especially the software upgrades that they were using in Ukraine, because uh, they uh, recently updated the S-300 with that capability in, I want to say, December of uh, 2022, and finally got it to everybody in uh, Janu uh, June of 2023, uh, if they didn't sell that software update, it's going to be a lot harder to track and target those theater ballistic missiles. So Iran had the right surface-to-air missile system for the wrong war. Okay, no, that makes sense. Do you do you put a do you put any credibility in the the recent comments 
um, that the Iranians are essentially naked. I think that was the, the quote. They're essentially naked to future attacks now because of these retaliatory strikes and the focus of, of the target package. Well, if we're playing strip poker here, they're down to their underwear. Uh, they have medium and short range systems like uh, Corad 15, uh, Pansir, or the SA-22, other short range Shorad systems that are homegrown. So some of their sites, yes, they, they might be well protected with these short range air defense systems, but the money maker, the long range systems aren't there anymore. And it's really going to have to make Iran evaluate its priorities about where it needs to put their spending. Okay. Um... Yeah, it, it does seem like uh, you could argue that basically what they've been doing, both with this strike and the previous strike, uh, is setting the table. I, I mean, I know they're sending a message as well, but it does seem as if they're setting the table for what they anticipate, you would have to imagine, is an eventual uh, you know, strike on their nuclear facilities. I, I think that is very likely in order to do something like that. Israel is going to need a heck of a lot more fuel tankers. Uh, just because they've attrited the S-300s, meaning Iran's long-range air defense system is essentially no longer viable, that doesn't mean that they can operate their fuel tankers over Iran with any kind of impunity. Uh, I, uh, Israel has uh, seven uh, modified Boeing 707s as mid-air refueling tankers. They also have seven uh, KC-130 uh, aircraft, or KC-130Ks, I believe, that can do mid-air refueling, but I don't know whether some of their equipment has the probe and drogue capabilities to refuel from those uh, KC-130s. So they might just be stuck with these seven, um, these seven 707s. And that really limits the amount of power that you can actually project. Your, your limitations are based on refueling tankers. So it's certainly possible that Israel might try to strike these sites, but it might have to be something that's done over the course of days as you're moving all of this mud out of the way to get to the bottom where the actual centrifuges or nuclear materials actually are. Yeah, I guess... Uh... The question would be, on their own, right? Would mm -hmm. they be capable of that type of of uh, of attack, or would that, by definition, look? If there was if there was consensus, or at least if there was a, a credible intel that said that that the regime, the Iranian regime, uh, was just on the cusp with their nuclear weapons program, uh, and you know that window had almost shut, you know, for taking action. At that point, you would have to imagine that the U.S. would have to be involved in that attack. I know this is complete speculation, but hey, yeah. it's my show. Why not? <laughs> well, you're absolutely correct. I mean, uh, a couple of B-2 bombers and the U.S.'s refueling capability and Iran no longer has a nuclear program. Israel, it would be a lot tougher. I actually did the math on this in a spreadsheet where I uh, figured that Israel could support 20 F-35s uh, in a long-range mission against Iranian targets, uh, but 20 F-35s equals approximately uh, four 2,000-pound bombs. And that's not a lot of ordnance when you're trying to move a lot of mud uh, out of the way. Uh, so if Israel did want to do this, they would need either, they, they would need refueling help from the United States or perhaps Jordan or perhaps Saudi Arabia, and all of those refueling uh, booms are compatible. And they could also do something like make a deal with Saudi Arabia, like, hey, can we use your uh, can we use your runways to strike Iran? Because it doesn't help you if they have a bomb either. And uh, the third thing would be Israeli audacity. I, you know, Israel is not beyond the capability of doing something like sending paratroopers into Iran, taking over an airfield for a couple of days and using that as a staging base. It would be incredibly dangerous, but Israel never seems to lack for audacity.